Hello, welcome. I'm glad you could make it today. Uh, we've got a lesson that's got a lot of good stuff in it. And we're going to follow up where we had been with Jesus being born. And then afterwards, when uh, the wise men visited him. Um, after all of that happened and he ended up back in Nazareth. Well, actually, he had never been there. But uh, Mary and Joseph had been from Nazareth and Jesus was then taken there. We don't hear anything about Jesus for about 10 years. Uh, we do find out that during that time, they would make the yearly um, visit to celebrate Passover in Jerusalem. And that was a big deal. It also indicated that they were doing their best to follow God. And so Jesus grew up with this being an important part of his life. Um, what we uh, don't know is just how much he knew about who he was as far as what Mary and Joseph told him. It seems like um, they didn't tell him that his father was really God and that Joseph was his stepfather. Um, probably a good idea when you're, you're talking about a, a young child or something like that who may not really understand it. But uh, by the time Jesus was 12, well, Let's just see what happened. They get to uh, Jerusalem. They have the Passover, which is a seven day celebration that started back when the Jewish people were trying to get out of Egypt and Moses was leading them out and God sent 10 plagues onto the Egyptians before Pharaoh finally let them go. So this was a, a big deal because it represented their freedom. And uh, the way people would do this celebration, they would travel in groups because a lot of people would be going there and uh, it was safer if you traveled in a big group. So the Passover is over, it's finished, and uh, Mary and Joseph head back with a big group of people. And apparently they thought Jesus was with some of their friends or other relatives and uh, he wasn't. They don't know that until the end of the first day's travel headed back. So they'd have been about 20 miles away from Jerusalem because they're walking the whole way. Uh, they check around. They can't find him anywhere. So they're scared. They know who he is and they've lost God's son. So they head on back to Jerusalem. So it would have taken them another day to get back. On the third day, they're looking all over Jerusalem trying to find him. And they finally end up at the temple, and there he is. And Jesus is there with the teachers. And the, these would be the people who really knew God's laws and knew how to follow them. And he's asking them questions, and he's giving them answers to questions they have. And they are amazed at how much he knows. And Mary and Joseph go up to him, and, and Mary says, don't you know we're worried about you? Your father and I have been looking all over, trying to find you. It's taken three days. And Jesus seems a little bit confused. And he says, didn't you know I'll be in my father's house? He shows that he knows who his real father really is. But he doesn't argue with them. He decides to do what is right. And he goes back with them. And he's an obedient son. And they go back to Nazareth. All right, we don't hear anything else about Jesus for a while, but the story shifts because you may remember that uh, Jesus has a cousin named John who was about six months older than Jesus. And John, at the age of 30, so this means several more years have passed. It's been about 18 years. Uh, at the age of 30, John begins his public ministry. And it seems like one of the, the rules I've heard about um, with Jewish teachers and anyone else who's, who's working for God, um, people would not take them seriously until they were at least 30 years old. I guess the idea was that they were too young to have learned everything they need to know. Well, by this time, John is 30 and he's out preaching and he looks very unusual. He wears clothing made from camel hair. He has a leather belt. 
and his food, he eats locusts, which are kind of like big grasshoppers, and wild honey. And so what that represents to the people and what we learn from that is that he was very poor because that kind of food um, was pretty much only eating, eaten by poor people. It also kind of tells us that he's on his own. Uh, if you remember, his parents were pretty old by the time he was born. Most likely they have died. He's not married, so he has no children either. And he's out on his own and he is preparing things for God. That's his mission. Um, he is telling people that, all right, God is about to do something big. He's going to bring his kingdom, the kingdom of heaven, also known as the kingdom of God. It is about here and you've got to get ready for it. In fact, John's mission is to prepare things for this. Uh, a lot of times they'll talk about about it, uh, people will talk about it as make clear paths for the Lord. You'll hear that, and that comes from Isaiah. And you kind of think of it this way say you have a, a yard that's full of tall grass, and you take a lawnmower and run it through it. And you have this path you can walk on that's a lot easier than going through the high grass. Or even if you have a sidewalk and it's covered with leaves and sticks and limbs and all of that, and you clear those out of the way so it's easier to walk on. His job is to clear things so that the one who is coming next, the Messiah, uh, people will be ready to receive him and understand that, okay, we're expecting him. Now let's listen to him. So uh, John um, is, is uh, along the Jordan River. Is baptizing people. Now, it's not the same baptism that uh, the Christians will institute later on. His is one of repentance, and the idea is that you would take your body and completely submerge it under the water. And while it cleans your body, it's also uh, cleaning your sins because you're repenting from it. You know, the idea is that you're sorry and that. Um, it's not a permanent cleansing from sin because that won't happen until uh, Jesus makes his sacrifice. But it is one showing that you do want to turn back from the bad things you've done and you want to do what is right. So he's preparing people in that way. And he's even saying, you know, there's somebody who's going to come along and baptize in the Holy Spirit. People don't understand what that means, but they realize John is not the top guy. He's not the last word from God. Now, uh, because of the manner in which he speaks, because he tells people right off that, you know, hey, look, don't think just because you're a descendant from Abraham, you're safe. Uh, because the Jewish people did think of themselves as God chosen, God's chosen people. And in a sense, they were. Uh, but what he's pointing out is that following God is the important thing, not uh, who you're descended from, not who you're grandfather or great-grandfather is. It's all on you to do what you should do. And he says, hey, look, um, if God needs people, he can make them out of the rocks if he wants to. Your job is to follow him and be prepared. So uh, word gets back to Jerusalem and some of the important religious people come down to see what John's all about. You know, there are Pharisees and Sadducees. Now, the Pharisees uh, a lot of times get a hard time because they're rule followers. In fact, they want to follow God's rules so much they'll even make up rules that they think God wants. Uh, because they'll say, well, God says to do this, so we should also do this. And sometimes they're right. A lot of times they're wrong on that. But they think the way to uh, be right with God is to follow all of these rules and think up more rules that you can follow. The Sadducees, on the other hand, uh, think that doing the ceremonial things in the temple are the right thing to do. Uh, problem with them is they also didn't believe in any kind of life after your body died. So you're not really sure why anyone would want to be a Sad Sadducee um, just because there's no hope for the future. I guess they thought any good thing they would get would happen while they're on the earth. And uh, a lot of times that could make them pretty harsh. And most of the people didn't really like them that much. But they were powerful. 
and a lot of times they would be the ones who would be the high priest, meaning the top religious person in the country. So he had these groups coming out to check on John, and he said, um, are you the Messiah? And he said, nope, not him. In fact, the Messiah is coming along, and I'm not even worthy of untying his shoes. Now, you might remember that with shoes, uh, they were considered very dirty and feet filthy and all that, and you'd have to be the lowest servant in order to do that kind of a job. And they said, well, um, are you the prophet? And they were talking about somebody that Moses had mentioned way back in the Old Testament. And he said, nope, not the prophet. And they said, well, are you Elijah? Well, you know, Elijah had been a prophet, but he had not died. He was taken to heaven without his body dying. And uh, people understood that he was supposed to come back. And uh, John says, nope, I'm not him either. Now, what John didn't understand, and Jesus knew later on, was that uh, Elijah wasn't physically coming back. It was somebody who was just like Elijah, or somebody who would remind people of Elijah who was coming back. And that was John, because here he was. He dressed a lot like Elijah. He was telling people the truth about what they should prepare for and what they shouldn't be doing. And he was he was tough on them. Um, kind of interesting because since he didn't have any family, he was on his own, he was free to say things because uh, he didn't have money either, he didn't have family, what could anyone take from him? He was prepared to die for God and there is nothing anyone could take from him or say that, you know, you stop doing this or we'll do this. So he was fearless in this sense. Uh, he knew who was coming along, but he wasn't totally sure who that person was. He knew that person would be the Messiah, also called the Christ. And uh, people didn't know what to make of him in many ways, but then they would ask him questions. And he said some things to them sounded a lot like what Jesus would say later on. They said, how, how should we act then? And he said, well, if you've got two shirts and there's somebody who doesn't have a shirt, give him one of your shirts. He said, if you're a soldier, just because you have weapons and all that, you don't pick on people and make them give you things. If you're a tax collector, you take what you're supposed to take in taxes, but not extra. You see, a lot of times people would think, okay, I can do kind of whatever I want because I have the power to do this, or God allowed me to be in this position, therefore he thinks it's okay for me to take extra things from people or do what I want. Well, that wasn't the case. He was telling them, you do what is right. It may not be the best thing for you physically, but spiritually, it's going to be the right thing to do. And there is more on John, but we're going to have to switch back to Jesus only I'm going to save that for next time. Now, one thing I would like for you to remember is that the food he ate was poor people's food. And we think, okay, you don't want to eat grasshoppers too much, but honey is pretty good. And for that, I wore this tie today. It's just Winnie the Pooh with a honey pot. Because we know Winnie the Pooh likes honey. Um, people in that day would like honey. And the thing I will point out before we go is that he was eating a poor person's food, but it also meant he was depending entirely upon God because the locusts, people didn't raise locusts to eat. You just have to gather them yourself. The wild honey means that it would be found someplace. It wasn't like somebody was a beekeeper and, and making his own um, devices to hold the hives and collecting honey that way. So uh, John was fearless. He was working for God, and he's going to prepare things before Jesus shows up. And next time we'll find out just how that happens. So you have a good evening, and hope to see you soon.